Um, thank you, Luca. It is a reduced audience. Hi. Um, so I'm going to follow very carefully what Luca just said, because I probably represent, unlike most of you, the commercial side of, of our industry. So I'm going to talk about enabling innovation, but uh, more importantly, I'm aware as a Brit that I'm allowed to say a, a sentence a little bit like this at the moment without upsetting too many people. So um, let's, let's try and do this. Um, so um, if you want to know more about me and my philosophy, you may want to read uh, something on our, on our website, which is why I hate McKinsey. Uh, and a lot of what I'm going to talk about today kind of follows that philosophy of hating uh, what has happened to our industry since the ideas embedded in the idea of the management consultancies have become part of, of what we do. So um, there's a book that I recommend each of you read, which is called The Third Plate by a guy called Dan Barber. Where, and he was asked to imagine what's the future of food? Not what will, we, what will we be eating technologically, but what is the future? What's the idea of food in the future? And there's a really interesting uh, image that he put in here. And if you look from left to right, there's a seed sitting top left, which is when you plant wheat every year. The, each panel shows the native wheat that would have existed had we not cleared it out of all the farmland in the US. That's the root system that wheat has naturally. So every year we plant, we get a little bit of wheat and we get a little bit of wheat at the top, but there's nothing left, there's no roots left, so we have to replant every year. There's no sustainability left in the soil. That's a system that we face in, in our farmland in the US where we have mostly one kind of wheat that, uh, that, that, we, that we grow across here. So as Lucas says, this idea of the ecosystem is important here when we're talking about the soil that we're growing our plants in within the US. And it leads to an absence of diversity, it leads to an absence of sustainability within the model and also leads to less nutritious wheat. Now, as we move forward and start to think about innovation within our space, if, if any of you are fans of The Princess Bride, as I am, you remember a lot of people use that word, but it doesn't mean what they think it means. It's inconceivable that innovation means what, uh, what, what we think. And the reason is that innovation is not the same as invention. And mostly what we talk about and we've been listening to in the last couple of days is actually invention. It's not innovation. Innovation is what you launch. It isn't what you invent, it's what you put on the market and it's what you make useful to people out there in the world. So Thomas Edison very famously launched a light bulb after about a thousand different attempts at making a light bulb. He launched one and he's the guy that made it popular in the same way as Edison invented the light bulb the way Steve Jobs invented the MP3 player. He wasn't the first but he's the first to make something that took off in the marketplace. So we talk about inventors and we talk about innovators, but actually we talk about innovation in a very specific, very technical way, which is it's what you launch. Now the question is, is our industry good at launching? And clearly it isn't. But it's also more important that we start to think about ourselves not as averages, but are there differences between the companies? We like to think of ourselves as an industry, but actually we're all individual players within a big space. So a few years ago, we asked ourselves that idea, if you gave the same molecule to two different companies at the beginning of phase two, would they do equally well? Does anyone want to think that they would? No one thinks that they would, right? So we thought, let's go and find out. Let's look at some objective measures of how good people are at taking products from phase two, beginning of phase two, through to uh, commercial success. And we created what's called the Productive Innovation Index seven years ago. And this is the ranking this year, 2016's ranking. J&J, &J, who are our top uh, of this year's ranking, have been top for four years. When they came top six years ago, everyone was surprised because J&J &J feel old. They don't feel innovative. They don't talk about innovation much. That's not so true anymore. Everyone is understanding that J&J have had a huge impact on, on what goes on in the, in the recent years. So this is the top 10. And the interesting thing in the top 10 is how few large pharma companies there are left still being innovative. So you've got to think, well, what is it about size that makes it difficult for people to be innovative anymore? And clearly, you go back to my central uh, hatred of McKinsey, uh, some of that is apparent in some of these organizations. So it matters. So the Productive Innovation Index shows, for example, that if you look at the, the green versus the orange number here, the average number of approvals per year for the top 10 
in that index versus the, the, the 20 to 30 group is twice, twice as many. Still not very many, one product per year. If you were a company of the size of J&J or, uh, or Nova Nordisk or, uh, or, or Biogen, it's not a lot. We're not launching a lot. The R&D spend per approval gained is a horrifying number. People, this number from Tufts has been bandied around a lot that it's $2 billion to launch a drug. It isn't. If you're down in, the, in 20 to 30, it's costing you $5.5 billion in R&D spend for every single product that you're launching at the moment. So we talk about the issue of sustainability. You think about how much you've got to recoup per launch drug if it's costing you $6 billion to, to get any product to market. It's a big issue. You should look at the R&D spend as a percentage of revenue that doesn't differ very much. So the companies in the top 10 are doing something fundamentally different than the companies in the bottom 10. And then you look at the freshness index, and the freshness index is a component of the productive innovation index. Uh, this is the percentage of sales in last year from products that you launched in the last five years. So the last five years isn't a long period, right? So you'd expect that we'd be putting new products into the pot. And this is the freshness index. Um, so the percentage along the bottom of, pro of revenue in 2015 from products that were launched in the last five years. And then up the side there, there's the 2015 revenues um, projected from quarter and the quarter three. Now you look at some of the companies down here on the, on the left-hand side, Pfizer, Roche, Novartis, GSK, Merck, UCB, no sales in the last five years from products that they launched in the last five years. Now that's an issue. It's an issue in terms of sustainability because we're not launching anything. We're not, it's not just that we're not launching great drugs, but we're not launching anything in this space. Now this is an issue. BMS, I suspect, is going to move out of that space very quickly. AstraZeneca is starting to move too. But the freshness index tells you that we have a problem systematically within our industry about in launching anything and launching it meaningfully. So the big issue is how do we begin to think about monetizing other people's science, which is what the industry mostly does anyway, right? That's what the industry is for, is monetizing science wherever it comes from. And we started to think about the collaborations and the discovery efforts and all sorts of things uh, sitting next to that. So it's one of the most critical skills that we could be there thinking about developing. And actually, the way that it mostly works in our industry is we discover great stuff, then a miracle happens, and then we make money. I think, as Luca says, we're expecting the PCSK9s that somehow over at the right-hand side, we make a fortune. We make $15 billion. Sitting in the middle, we forgot to figure out how we're going to do that, how we're going to talk to the payers, how we're going to talk to the physicians about what it is that we just gave them that makes a difference. And I think the biggest issue that we see, and you know, I don't want to reflect on the last couple of days, but a lot of the innovation efforts that we see are around discovery, they're around open innovation, they're around collaboration. So people are using the language of innovation, but they're not doing it where it really matters, which is into the difference in the commercial models that we could be thinking about to make our industry sustainable. As Luca says, the number of times that I see our clients talking to HTAs early enough to get a, a, a viewpoint on, is this value proposition OK versus this other one? Um, they're not really thinking hard enough about changing those commercial models. And then we think about introducing gene, gene therapies, cell therapies, innovative products that no one's got an idea how to use or where to use them. And we're not taking the, the risk on our own. We're basically trying to make the markets pay for our innovation efforts. So one question for everyone that we talk to is, do we believe the future is certain? Now, most people will give you that it's not, right? They'll give you, no, of course it's not certain. We, the future is pretty much unpredictable. And then you get into things like biology. Then you get into things like proteomics and metab metabolomics and genomics. Is the future predictable? And you go, well, no, of course it's not. You know, and even if you look at something like this, which is, you know, we still don't entirely understand how vitamin A works in the body. <clears throat> it appears to regulate at least several hundred genes. So we don't understand vitamin A. We certainly don't understand where Opdivo works, and we don't understand uh, necessarily where Savaldi's works in the future. So we don't understand vitamin A. We don't understand a lot of things. The future is inherently uncertain. But the question is, do we behave as if the future is uncertain? And of course, as an industry, we don't. It's an industry that, fortunately, is full of some of the smartest people I've ever met. 
And then we try and make them manage uncertainty down to predictability. We try and bring it down to numbers and individual percentage points. And then we try and guess how much a product's going to make. As we heard Deborah say yesterday, we got Gleevec wrong, you know, fortunately. We've got Lipitor wrong, fortunately. But we've got everything wrong. All of the forecasts we make in our industry are wrong. You know, no one's ever had one pre-launch that came out right. But all we spent all of our effort trying to predict that with absolute certainty. We try and predict with absolute certainty where our drugs will work and where they won't. And then we find out that we, that we were wrong. And we do it all of the time. So as we start to think about that we fail, the next question is, do we fail well? Are we failing in the right way? Or are we just failing a lot? Are we failing in the same way every time? Or do we start to learn something from the ways that we fail? And of course, you know, the answer is no. We don't fail well. We just keep doing the same thing over and over again and hoping this time it's going to be different. And we call it attrition, even though it's the wrong use of the word attrition, because that suggests it's inevitable, it's inexorable. But we could be doing something fundamentally different in this space. So um, everyone shows their elephant at some point. Um, but it's important that we all try and figure out, are we looking at the same thing? So the diagnosis of discovery, the diagnosis of development, the diagnosis of commercial, all links into this same beast, but we're looking at it in different ways. And this, this cartoon sort of illustrates this, 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 you know, the hole in the boat, we all understand. And everyone's arguing about whose, hole it's, uh, whose side the hole is in. But we're forgetting that we're going to be going over a waterfall that Luca has just described. And no one's really trying to figure this out uh, as, a, as, an, as, a, as an industry. And things like reputation matter. But also, we need to be, remember, we don't need to solve for the industry's problems. We need to solve for our own company's problems. You know, historically, people used to trust Merck. The Merck Manual isn't many years past being the most respected book in the, in the healthcare space. Pharmaceuticals used to have a useful reputation. So this ecosystem that we're, that we're playing in, um, from birth through death, through pregnancy, through illness, through all sorts of things, this is our soil. This is the place where we plant our seed, and this is the place that we want to start to uh, derive dollars or, or some other value from. But if you think about the way that, that we talk about this ecosystem, you know, many of you I know talk about them as subjects, you know, participants in clinical studies. Many of you talk about them as patients. Many of you talk about them as people with a disease. Many of us talk about them as a source of revenue, which is, you know, that is our soil, that's our terroir, if you like, that we're, that, that we're, that we're playing within. Um, and of course, over the last couple of days, we've heard most of these people described as data. You know, if only we collected more data, suddenly we'd be in a much better space than we are. But what do we mean by data? Where, where, where comes the bit where someone says what they want versus how you measure it? You know, there's all sorts of biomarkers that a patient will give you if you just ask them uh, a little bit about what they want to achieve. So we've been focusing on what they need, assuming that what they need is more survival or they need the, their disease cured. But what about what they want? And sitting next to that, we talk about health a lot, we talk about outcomes a lot, we talk about wellness a lot, but actually there's also the well-being component of end of life that we need to be thinking about harder. So in this ecosystem, we want to think about the issue. The farmer takes financial risk, and the farmer gets financial reward. And that's the way we like it, and we take all of it. So we take all of the financial risk, and we take all of the financial reward, and we prefer it that way because it's a closed-loop system. The issue is the financial reward that we're getting today pays for a discovery that goes into a drug that might hit the market in 20 years' time. That's actually injecting a different kind of risk. It's injecting a cash flow risk to our, to our model. Well, the thing is, people, a lot of people who will see that as a place where they could intervene too. VCs, other people are very interested in taking financial risk and financial reward from us. And as Luca just uh, uh, indicated, people are paying us to do all of this work. They might decide that we're not the best people to be giving the money to, uh, to, to do it. So this question of sustainability becomes a big issue in terms of uh, innovation. And then we think about the way we talk about patients. And this is derived from a, um, it's a parody website called Cell Drugs. Um, and this is the way that I see most companies. Everyone says patient, patient centricity, patient value. Um, and we asked the question once, we went to see someone, how are you measuring patient value? I said, what do you mean? Well, Patient value, you know, you're using it as a phrase constantly. What does it mean? 
do you have any metric? Do you have any scale for assessing value to patients? Well, no. Is anything that adds, adds value to their lives? Anything? And of course, the answer was, in the absence of a specific outcome, anything will add value to a patient's life. But this is the traditional quarter. So everyone talks about patients, and then they get to the end of the quarter, and they report dollars upstairs. They don't report patient value to anyone. And we talk about sales of products. We talk about revenues for products. We don't talk about value that we added to patients' lives. So as we go through, of course, it's an issue if we just ask patients what they want. Let's ask patients what they want, and let's plan that in. Well, patients don't necessarily know what they want. If any of you have seen The Simpsons, you may remember the Homemobile, which was built specifically for all of the things that Homer wanted to see in a car. People who take medicines are not the people to be asking what they want in a medicine, because they don't know what they can have. They don't know what you can give them. They don't know what the possibilities are. They don't know how to put technologies together. So all they can give you are statements about what they'd like to see for themselves, but they don't know how to design your products. They can't tell you what they like. Of course, people want a cure for hepatitis C. Of course, people want to be cured of cancer. But they can't tell you how. It's our job to figure out how we solve that particular conundrum. And if you think about the way that we talk about design and what a product is, we tend to talk about the molecule. And you know, I hate it when people talk about molecules, because that's not what we're taking to market. We talk about product. We're talking about indication, patient population, line of therapy, trial endpoints, the formulation, the IP biomarkers, companion diagnostic, trial power, all of this stuff matters in terms of what we mean by a product. If you look at Opdivo versus Keytruda, no one knows whether one's better than another. One's outselling the other by four to one because it talked to more of what is needed when you launch a product than Keytruda did in the same space. So we talk about design because all of these things matter to the payer when you get there. They matter to the physician when you get there, and they also matter to the patient. So we need to stop talking about molecules as if somehow they're interchangeable, because they're not. There's a value to the product that you, that you decided to launch. But pharma sees shots on goal in this way, and you know, one of the biggest issues that I see, and you know, hands up, every time we've looked at this, there is no commercial model for a disease modifier in Alzheimer's. I'll say that very coldly today. Lots of people are developing Alzheimer's disease modifiers. I'll tell you that every time we've looked at it, there is no commercial proposition. You can spend a billion dollars putting one into phase three if you want, but there is no one that's prepared to pay for one if you launch it. And Luca's sort of a warning shot with a PCSK9 is exactly that. You think there's an obvious opportunity in Alzheimer's. It isn't as obvious as we see it. So this is the way pharma sees it. Just line lots of balls up, and we'll keep shooting at the Alzheimer's goal, forgetting to specify what Alzheimer's is or what we're planning to offer to Alzheimer's. But this is the way it should be. We could be studying Lewy body dementia. We could be studying mixed dementia, vascular dementia. We could be studying all kinds of things that are not Alzheimer's with an asset that does what it does. And it might be easier, it might be cheaper, it might be quicker, it might be faster to get to market. And it might actually be more, of more benefit to the patients that we're giving it to. So shots on goal isn't just lining up lots of, ball against, lots of balls against one goal. It's about having lots of different shots. And if any of you are football fans, you'll remember this game where Germany won 7-1 in the World Cup. The interesting thing statistically was Brazil had more shots, as many shots on target, but only connected once versus Germany seven times. I hate this as a Brit, because we keep losing to Germany every single time we play them. So. But if we measure productivity in pharma by anything other than getting a ball in the back of the net, we're doing it wrong. We're not measuring the right thing. Because um, it's the only place that we get paid until that point, it's all cost. The only time we get paid is if we start to launch things. And that is the only source of revenue for all of us in our industry. So Voltaire once observed, God is not on the side of the biggest battalions, but of the best shots. And this is the lesson of history. Strategy matters. You know, taking careful aim matters. If any of you have read David and Goliath, the Malcolm Gladwell book, it says the same thing. You know, how careful you shoot matters way more than that your size in the battle. Um, but it matters, right? Because we make a lot of money. And if any of you are Star Wars fans or Harry Potter fans, you'll see the little blue lines that tell you how much their franchises have made over their life cycle. And it's nothing compared to Lipitor. Nothing compared to Adver, nothing compared to Plavix. You know, I'm talking about franchises, so every, every movie, 
every piece of merchandise, everything that's ever been put into Star Wars, ever, makes less than, uh, than, than, than we made with Hercept and Farosh. So we're making a lot of money. So people talk about, will there be money to fund our interest in the future? Well, clearly there will. We might just have to accept different, uh, different revenue models. Now, remember, um, the forecast for Libertor was to hit a billion dollars per year of peak year sales. It was never forecast to do $14 billion a year, which is what it ended up doing. Libertor itself was bigger than Pfizer was before they bought Libertor. So the company that bought Libertor ended up with one product that was bigger than it was before they bought it. So, you know, there's still a lot of money in our space uh, to, to be played with. And as Luca says, Savaldi actually is an interesting use case. So we used to be familiar with this peak year sales being five or 10 years after launch. Not anymore. Savaldi in its first year from a standing start hit $14 billion. But they should, they deserve to. They launched a cure in a disease that had been happy with incremental uh, innovation, if you use that word, for a long time. People were very comfortable with the status quo. They launched a cure. They deserve some revenue. Um, we've got issues with how they managed the, the communications around that cure, but actually, you know, let's praise uh, uh, Gilead or Farm Asset for, for what they did. Um, so, question for you. If you imagine a brilliant inventor came along and said to you that he invented a pill, that if you drop it into a gallon of distilled water, would turn it into, ga into gas or petrol, how much would you be willing to pay per pill? So this is, this is interesting, right? So this, is, this tells you something about a value proposition of something that's hard to extract, hard to uh, manufacture, hard to distribute, and we've got water. And price of gasoline for most of the last 50 years has been the same. So we've got to think hard about what we mean by our value proposition and, and how much people want to pay us for it as well, because we all depend on petrol, gasoline, the same way we depend on our medicines, but people aren't prepared to pay for it. How much would you be prepared to use Google every day? It's, it's essential for all of us, but none of us are prepared to pay for it directly. So we've got to think about the alternative commercial models in our space. Um, so if we think about this model, we've got a lot of people that are involved in this model. We've got the farmer, we've got us, we've got the regulator, we've got the payer, we've got the physician, we've got the prescriber, we've got the family, we've got a whole bunch of people that are part of our ecosystem of risk and reward. And it isn't just that we're putting, putting all the risk in, people put risk in too. Everyone that goes into our studies uh, does so with risk. And the way that it works is, if you imagine this waiter carries all of these uh, uh, plates out to the restaurant, to the, to, the, to the table, and drops nine out of 10 of them, and still charges you for all 10, because they made them. And we'd like you to pay for all 10, because that's the way that our, our, our restaurant makes money. We make food, we bring it out, we drop a lot of it, but whatever, we'd like you to pay for it. We'd all get upset about that, right? But if you think about the way that we work in our space, most of our drugs don't work in most of our people that we give them to. So never mind the ones that have failed to get even to this point. If with our imprecise medicine, we're offering people things that don't work in most of the people that we give them to, and we're still asking them for all of the money for all of these people, this is gonna become an issue. So we wanna to move towards outcome-based payment we've already got an issue, because if you're marketing Abilify and it only works in one out of the five people that you give it to, and you want to be paid for all five, that's going to become more of an issue, and it should be, because we should, have a, you know, we should be taking care of our own reputation within this space. And it isn't just an issue. I've heard a lot of people say, we need to get patients into clinical studies. It's a big thing. We've got to, get, we've got to move them in, move them in, move them in. This was a paper in uh, uh, clinical cancer research last year from an oncologist that says, because patients treated can be harmed, a lot of the studies that we're putting them into shouldn't be performed. Bar should be raised, making decisions to move from phase two to phase three. We should be more critical and better advocates for cancer patients. So don't just assume everyone with cancer wants to get into a study. I met a woman with lung cancer last week that's refused to go into a study because she said, pharma sees me in two ways. They see me as a carrier for my tumor. That's all I am. So I'm someone that gets my tumor into their clinical study, and they're interested in the size of it, the, the location of it. They're not interested in me. 
for any other reason than that I bring my tumor to their study. So she said, that's why I've never taken part in the study. So the other thing they're interested in is, is me saying nice things about their medicine that I'm on. She said, and, but when I go to them and say, look, I've got a rash, what do I do? They don't know the answer. And the oncologist doesn't know the answer because no one's told the oncologist the answer about what I do with the rash that I got today. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? So she said, so they want me to say nice things, but there's no relationship. There is no management of me as a, as a person that's taking your medicine and directly or indirectly paying a lot of money for the, for the privilege of, get, of gaining a few more uh, years in my life. So getting patients on the studies is clearly good, but it's not the only thing. And then we think about who our competition is. Uh, Cleveland Clinic, as, a, as a, a classic example, is not a pharma company, but 2,700 patent applications 700 approved patents from Cleveland Clinic recently. It's launched more than 70 spin-off companies to develop medical products. And if any of you come from San Francisco, you'll know that most of the space around Genentech is full of people that left Genentech to start their own company. Genentech has lost out on all the value of all the people that it could have started in their own spin-out companies. Um, but the important thing about the Cleveland Clinic is they are direct, cutting-edge interface. They know what the problems with the healthcare system are. So, and they ask everyone that works there to say, what are the problems? Give us a problem-rich environment against which we can innovate. So as we start to think about the problems of us in pharma, this has been the traditional model. People clear the regulatory approval hurdle, and then they stood looking at, oh shit, what do we do now? As Lucas says, in Europe, but more, more increasingly in, in the US as well, it's not as open to us as we, as we used to think. We need to think about all of these hurdles because this is the ecosystem that we're drawing our funds from to pay for all of the work that all of us do. So I've written before about the enemies of innovation and there's, there's many things that I hate here. I hate the TPP, this thing where none of us believe it, it gets created as an internal document, never gets used, never gets turned into anything useful. The ENPV is a horrible, horrible device. Should be, if you ban the ENPV tomorrow, you'd be making better decisions. It puts predictability and certainty into an, into an environment that is un, inherently uncertain. And the people that, you're, that are putting together your EMPVs are the least qualified people in our industry. If we banned it tomorrow, we'd be making better decisions. Same thing with most of the templates that we use. Same thing with silos. You think about the way that we work in our silos. We don't really get to sit around a table even like these guys and discuss what it is that we're doing. This is why small companies are doing better than large companies is because they don't have these silos. They have skunk works teams, essentially, that are putting together product launches. So silos are a big issue in pharma, and actually the problem doesn't seem to be going away. It seems to be increasing. We're getting more and more silos. So digital is a silo now instead of being an enabler. Blockchain, you know, will probably be sitting in its own silo, sitting next to the IT department somewhere, but not really coming as, as part of, uh, of what we do. And I mentioned what I think about marketing in all of this. So we need to think about innovation differently. And the best way to be in the water when the wave comes is to budget time for swimming. So how do we behave as an industry? Will we be there when the wave comes? Most people don't need a process to be more innovative. They need permission. They need a way of being more innovative within our space. They need to know how uh, any of this is, 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 is going to happen. And if you think about the way that most companies are set up, they spend much more time in exploration, exploratory research, than they do launching. Our thought is we just put stuff in and let it die at some point on the vine, and we hope that one or two products make it through. See, for many companies, that isn't working. And it's because we're not putting enough good medicines into phase three. We're putting medicines that we hope work into phase three and then finding out whether they do or not. But we're not really using phase three for what it's good for, so we're not even lined up next to the way that most innovation-led companies uh, work. So the pharma company of the future moves from R&D to R and D, so we do research, and then we develop. We do exploration until we know what we've got. We, it isn't attrition uh, if we use research to find out what the drugs actually do. We need to fully commit development. So of course there'll be failures for unknown unknowns, as was discussed yesterday, but the known unknowns should be removed. So we shouldn't be putting products into phase three that we, that we don't know that they work against the placebo, for example. The marketing needs to move from being sales support, which is one of the biggest issues that we have with our reputation, to an understanding of what markets want. Two-way communication instead of one-way communication. We need to be exploring what people want. We need to be providing meaningful product support. 
And if we go back to this thing, we need to put down deeper roots. And we need to allow deeper roots into the system. We need to be not uh, systematically harvesting the soil for what it had. We need to be maintaining the health of the soil uh, over, the, over the period that, we're, that we want to use it. And there's a quote, again, from this book um, about the way the Mennonites think about rubber tires on tractors. They say, look, as soon as you put rubber tires on a tractor, easy movement. Easy movement means the farm will grow, more profit, more profit. We buy more land, less crop diversity, more machinery, and so on. Pretty soon the farmer becomes less intimate with his farm, and that leads to ignorance and eventually to loss. And most of us will agree that's sort of what's happening here, is that we're losing connection with the soil and the farm that we used to be very familiar with. So um, I'll leave there with a couple of slides. This was from another book, but what if we're wrong? Great book that I recommend. So landing and moving around the, the moon offers so many serious problems for human beings it may take science another 200 years to, get, to lick them. It was said in 1948. And as was pointed out here, it wasn't that they were wrong or that they were illogical. They were wrong about the motivation, not about the logic. We need to provide a motivation to our uh, environment that moves us forward. Um, and 150 years ago, do any of you know this? Chicago was lifted up. If you said to us today, I want to lift the city up, buildings, take them and lift them so that we can drain into the lakes because we need a sewage system. We all think that's crazy. Who would even try to do that today? Lift the city up and its buildings. We could do it 150 years ago. So what we need is the motivation to change the way that we can do things because things are possible. We can reimagine how we do what we do. So um, if you want to uh, copy the slides, I will happily give them to you. Um, if you want to uh, follow me on Twitter, please do. Um, I think I'm handing back to somebody else now. So Luca, are you there? Um, Beatrice. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank well, you. Impressive, Mike. Thank you very Thank you. much.